Welcome you all to today's research exchange. We have Dr. Ted McGear here. Dr. Tad McGear here from uh, Aerovel. He's going to talk to us about his work in uh, aeronautical engineering. Uh, just in case you are not aware, Friday is a holiday. Friday is Veterans Day, so we're not having Eye for Energy this week, so please feel free to enjoy your, your day off. And we have flyers in the back for big ideas. So it's a student proposal competition. We have $45,000 available for the best student proposals. And uh, the deadline is November 21st for the first round of your proposal. So please see the flyers in the back and uh, feel free to enter. So uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tad McGear. He trained as an aeronautical engineer at Princeton and Stanford. And then he joined this, the uh, faculty at Simon Fraser University in Canada. Uh, he then joined a startup in 1990, Aurora Flight Sciences, where he helped design uh, early studies on un unmanned research aircraft. And then he went on to found the In-Situ Group, which pioneered development of miniature robotic, robotic aircraft in world, 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 worldwide trials. And then uh, that company, In-Situ, got sold to uh, Boeing. And now he has started another uh, company called Aerovel in 2006. And he's going to talk to us about some of their uh, work on flex rotors. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. It's on, right? It's on. You hear me? Okay, good. Well, there's the title of the talk. That's a somewhat edited version of the title. Good enough. Uh, so here's what I'm going to cover. I'm going to talk a bit about applications of economics and of flex order, which is what we're working on. That's the fun part of the talk. But since it's Berkeley and this is Citrus, I should talk a bit about public policy. So discuss public policy toward unmanned aircraft and other things. Uh, let's talk about uh, the motivating application first. Offshore weather reconnaissance. Um, the, your weather forecasts rely heavily on in situ measurements uh, made by various things. Uh, but the most valuable source of information comes from old fashioned weather balloons that go up from about a thousand sites around the world. Uh, they're valuable because they give you uh, the primitive information you need through the full depth of the atmosphere. Uh, the difficulty is that it's only economical to launch balloons from populated sites on land. So out over the ocean, uh, you have what's called a data void. And uh, lack of soundings there is a real problem for forecasting. So uh, the idea here is to make something, uh, make small aircraft that can go out uh, over oceans in remote areas and collect the data that you want at a price that you can afford. Uh, it's good for uh, sort of routine forecasting, we cover the whole Pacific, uh, and for uh, severe weather forecasting, like hurricanes, uh, so that uh, if we base small aircraft in two or three sites around the Atlantic, we could maintain continuous monitoring through the hurricane season uh, and get uh, information, including down to the boundary layer of the storm, which is where all the energy exchange takes place, it would be very helpful for intensity forecasting, which at the moment, as any hurricane force forecaster will tell you, is done with no skill at all. You can tell where it's going to go, but you can't really tell how strong it's going to be when it gets there. Uh, so uh, we want a way to do this economically, uh, and it can be done within current observing budgets, which is, means that you want to do a global observing program for at most tens of millions of dollars per year. So that's the motivation for a small, long-range unmanned aircraft, which is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, but I said, at a cost you can afford. Now we'll start with one of the uh, bad news points about unmanned aircraft. Here is what aircraft cost. Uh, you can go to a general aviation airport, uh, rent a Cessna Skyhawk. Uh, you can do it an hour from now at about $100 an hour. You can pick up your phone and do this. Uh, you can work your way up to something like a small biz jet for maybe $2,000 an hour. So that's what manned aircraft cost. Uh, Compare that with unmanned aircraft. This is a Scandial built by my, my previous company, um, in situ. It's being sold to you, the taxpayer, uh, for about $2,000 per hour. And that's if you buy in units of 10 to 20,000 hours at a time. So here, an hour from now, uh, you buy an hour, $100. Here you have to buy in bulk, and it's delivered months down the road. And that's cheap by unmanned aircraft standards. If you move to a Predator, which is something you hear a lot about in the news, you're talking uh, many times more than that. So at those prices, well, who's buying? Only taxpayers, right? I'm interested in um, 
civil applications, so we have to do substantially better than I bet aircraft has done to date. Uh, so uh, bear that in mind when you see stories like this. Uh, this is from uh, a couple of years ago. U.S. launches unmanned aircraft patrols along the Manitoba border, so we're going to fly predators along the Manitoba border. Does this sound suspicious? Why is this a bad idea? Is it a bad idea because there's nothing to see along the Manitoba border? <laughs> or is it a bad idea because if there were something to see, the way to see it would not be by looking through an unmanned aircraft camera like this, which is what you do. Uh, well, the answer is both of the above. So what's going on here? Uh, it's, that's what, it's, it's a boondoggle, right? There's a lot of that going on. So uh, there's a lot of nonsense in unmanned aircraft. Uh, but there are also some sensible things. Well, I'll tell you what the constraints on sensible things are. Uh, first, if you look at those costs, uh, you're not going to compete directly with the Cessna Skyhawk. Uh, so uh, find somewhere else. But uh, what's somewhere else? There might be niche applications. We do have to make reductions in cost. Uh, we need to improve reliability, which is a real problem with unmanned aircraft. Uh, stay away from manned traffic, because manned traffic will outbid you. You have to get where uh, manned aircraft are expensive. Uh, if you can make small aircraft, which is what I'm interested in, then you're bringing something small as opposed to operating something big. So there should be an economy there. And if it's unmanned, you should be able to get to the point where you're operating multiple aircraft with one person. That's not the situation now. The situation now with unmanned aircraft is there are multiple persons, one aircraft. So we have to invert that. Uh, all these conditions mean the markets are small. So that's why this winds up being done by companies like me, with 10 guys in a house as opposed to Boeing, right? 100,000 people. Uh, all right, so those are the constraints. Now, uh, a bit of history. Uh, first aircraft uh, I developed at my old company, uh, an aircraft called an Arison, a test bed for weather reconnaissance uh, for typhoons and severe thunderstorms. We demonstrated with this test bed that we could fly into those things. Uh, we demonstrated long range by flying one across the Atlantic in 1998. Uh, this aircraft was launched, as you can see from a car top, and landed on its belly. Uh, just to show you what you can do in hurricane reconnaissance, here's a typhoon uh, going to Taiwan. And this is a track of an aircraft flying at 50 knots, uh, going into the eye of a hurricane, where the uh, speed was about 110 knots. Now, I can show you a short video <coughs> of uh, the aircraft track superimposed upon the radar image of the storm. It's close enough to show you can see the whole thing on radar. So there we are into the eye and then out through the eye wall through the reddest parts of the radar signature. So that's nasty weather. Uh, you don't want to be in uh, those conditions at low altitude in a manned aircraft. But you can do it unmanned and you can get the information you want. Uh, so that was a test bed. Uh, so far, this idea, after 20 years, hasn't yet caught on with the weather services. Uh, maybe with FlexRoad, we'll make it economical enough that that will happen. Uh, then the next aircraft we built uh, came in various versions. Uh, one version is called GeoRanger, and this slide illustrates uh, some of its conveniences and some of its disadvantages or handicaps. Uh, this aircraft was catapult launched, and it was retrieved uh, by a system we called Skyhook here. Uh, there's a rope dangling from that man lift. The aircraft flies into the rope. Uh, the rope moves to a cleat at the wing, and a second later, the aircraft is dangling from uh, its wingtip. Uh, anyway, so uh, it means that you can operate. You don't need a car. Uh, you don't need a runway for the car to run on. You can uh, set up on the lawn of, for example, this bed and breakfast where we were doing a trial on the north coast of Prince Edward Island. So it was uh, a compact system. It was designed to operate off ships. Uh, is operating off ships uh, quite frequently now. Uh, but there's this heavy stuff that goes with it. A catapult, which weighs 1,000 kilograms or something, is this man lift. You have to carry all that around. And when you're doing applications development, uh, that's a lot of stuff to carry around. It significantly adds to cost. Uh, compare that with, uh, well, I'll skip that slide. Compare that with uh, this. Uh, this is what passes for commercial success in the unmanned aircraft business, Yamaha helicopter. Uh, now discontinued, but hundreds of them were sold. Now its success owed uh, something to the remarkable protectionist tariffs that, there, that exist on rice in Japan, and so it can succeed in somewhat artificial environment. But also, its success uh, derives from it being a helicopter. You can operate it easily from a farmer's field. So there's some advantage to vertical takeoff and landing. Uh, so that appealed to me. Uh, 
uh, the idea that if you could make a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, you could operate it with uh, a minimum of fuss on the ground uh, and maybe do it economically. But I also want to go a long way. I want to get over to the middle of the ocean, stay there for a useful period of time. Uh, well, now there are three concepts we're trying to uh, combine here. Vertical takeoff and landing, long range, and economy. Uh, if you mention those three words in one sentence to an aeronautical, aeronautical engineer, he'll tell you you're nuts. Those things don't normally go together. And there's plenty of history to back that. This is known as the Vistol Wheel of Misfortune. You can find it online. Around the perimeter of this thing, in all 45 varieties, are the various types of vertical takeoff and landing machines, excluding helicopters, by the way, that have actually progressed to a flight vehicle, right? So I'm not even talking about the crazy ideas that never make it past paper. Uh, now, in bold here, there, uh, sorry, here, and the Harrier, one other place, uh, there, those two, two places in bold, those are things that have actually gone to production. The rest of these are test vehicles. And going to production uh, here, as anybody in the Defense Department will tell you, doesn't mean uh, being economical. So this is not uh, necessarily encouraging at the beginning if you want to talk about economy and long range together with vertical takeoff and landing. But uh, with small aircraft, I think you can do something. We're going to look down in this vicinity of tail sitters. Uh, here's a, one of the uh, things that didn't make it onto that uh, wheel of misfortune because it was never built, but there are some good ideas in this patent from 1946. Uh, let me point out the good ideas. One. Uh, Low disc loading, big rotor for a small aircraft. You need that if you want to make a long range aircraft with a small economical power plant. It's like a powered sailplane. So we need uh, a big rotor. So that's what we have in this uh, patent. Uh, big rotor means you need a reduction drive. Uh, then uh, you build a helicopter and a single rotor helicopter has to have some anti-torque device, some roll control device. That's what a tail rotor in a helicopter does. So here we have those on uh, the tips of the wings. Uh, so those are the good points. Uh, now, the not so good points. Uh, remember, this is 1946. Uh, you had to do things mechanically. So there's all this cross-shafting gearbox to drive the thrusters. That's heavy and unpleasant. Uh, then another big problem is there's a pilot. And notice the, notice the seat here. The pilot is facing down. This is not a tail sitter. This is a nose sitter. Why is it a nose sitter? Uh, it's to avoid this problem. This is a tail sitter. This is the Convair XFY prototype fighter in 1954. That's Skeets Coleman, one of the two guys who was brave enough to fly this thing. Why did it take guts to fly this thing? Because to land it, you have to go into reverse in an airplane, and you can't see where you're going. <laughs> that's a problem. So uh, here, that's solved by having the guy look down, right? Uh, but now what happens? Well, that means that when you're hovering, this rotor has to push that way. And then when you go to forward flight, it has to push this way. Now, uh, it turns out it's already, it's already a lot to ask to have a rotor that will operate efficiently pushing one way and hover and pushing the same way, but uh, in forward flight when it's at what we call a different advance ratio. Here, we're asking for it to push efficiently in different directions in those two regimes. That's, that's too much. And in order to make that happen, you need variable twist, not just variable pitch, variable twist. So this rotor has to deform. And so there's an elaborate mechanical scheme which would never have worked to make that happen. Uh, no empennage, you rely on the rotor to provide uh, pitch and yaw stability. So uh, no, let me go back one. So those are, there's some good ideas and there's some bad ideas. Let's throw out the bad ideas and keep the good ideas. And that, that we get this aircraft we're working on, which is a complex rotor. So this is uh, a tail sitter in the sense that it uh, points upward to hover with the large rotor. Uh, it uh, then moves over into wingborne flight where it flies like conventional aircraft efficiently. Uh, and its arrangement for wingborne flight are standard. And in hover, it's a helicopter rotor plus wingtip thrusters, just as in the patent. 
And uh, also, because it hovers, we have the ability to do fully autonomous turnaround. So not just autonomous in the air, but also on the ground. I'll uh, show a video that illustrates that. Well, here's the video. This is from our first transition flight this is uh, back in August. This is a flex rotor prototype hovering before the first transition to wing borne flight. The flight demonstrated flex rotor's unique ability to combine vertical takeoff and landing enough? with long range, which we expect to be upward of 3,000 kilometers over more than 36 hours in the air. A few minutes yeah, earlier, she had been assembled and restored yep. and checked out by operators in the control station bus. Flex rotor is designed to be fully autonomous, not only in the air, but also on the ground, with launch, retrieval, and turnaround done hands-free by a simple handling rig. The engine is started and run up in a docking station, and then the aircraft is run out on parallel bars for launch. The aircraft then climbs away briskly in preparation for transition. Set tail for wing borne flight. When enough altitude is in hand, which for this test included plenty of margin, okay, the aircraft Start pitches over into power. a dive and then pulls so out entry into wing borne altitude. flight. Initial this time it made a little nose down RPM. wobble, which Pulling wasn't quite right, so the dive was longer than intended. Pushing but over. it worked out alright in the end. Inaccurate. Overspeed, 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 GPS In wingborn satellite. In flight, handling is conventional, although the low cruise power and big, practically silent rotor make for unusual sights and sound. Speed here is about 50 knots. For transition back to hover, the aircraft establishes about 70 knots and then pulls to vertical. In this case, climbing about 100 meters in three seconds. Now, setting zoom entry speed. Zooming, overspeed, overspeed, velocity inaccurate, stabilizing thrust up, velocity inaccurate, transition complete. Okay, we're going to north, yes. Next, the tail is stowed for retrieval. Set tail for okay. retrieval. All right, you ready? Yep, I'm ready. Go ahead. Enabling QWS. For the moment, we are using control wheel steering okay, to guide the aircraft for landing with the autopilot being commanded through joysticks by an outside pilot. Soon, this step should become fully automated using differential GPS navigation. Hey Rob, you ready? Okay, so the aircraft is dropped out of the truth forest and the engine shut down. Kill engines now. The aircraft is then run back into the docking station where it can be secured and refueled for the next flight. It's just hard to see out there. Good. Well, I, I apologize for the quality of the video, but we're not very professional at that. Anyway, I've, I've got a little more at the end. I'll show that at the end of the talk. So uh, I'll say a few words about the handling ring. There it is. Uh, there's the aircraft flying either out of it or into it. There's the aircraft dropped onto it. Uh, and as you saw, you, you could do a fully automatic turnaround. Uh, the aircraft parks, it can be serviced. Uh, it's also lightweight. We can, we can carry the parts around in a small bag. And uh, it's designed this way so that uh, we think it's suitable not only for calm conditions on the ground, but also in rough conditions on a small boat where everything's moving and the wind is gusting. Uh, the idea is that the aircraft, uh, under those circumstances, is moving around relative to the uh, bars there that are sticking out waiting to catch it. And when it's gusty and everything's moving, you can't necessarily maintain position for a long period of time. But with uh, differential GPS, you can navigate very precisely. And if you stay in the neighborhood, you can tell when you're in the right spot with lower relative velocity. And then you can come down, essentially, in free fall. Uh, so the idea is to hover in the neighborhood, wait for the moment, and then plunk down into the bars. Uh, so we think that's going to be suitable for quite small boats. Uh, so uh, here's where we are. Uh, we started the company uh, five years ago, uh, started flying the aircraft uh, as a helicopter uh, a year and a half ago, uh, then did the first transition flights back in August. Uh, so far we've done four of those. Uh, and we're performing as modeled, both wingborne and thrustborne. Uh, so now we've, we're happy with the prototype and we're working to uh, build a production version of the aircraft going to the U University of Washington wind tunnel full scale in December. Uh, to refine the aerodynamics, and uh, maybe we're a year from having a product. Uh, so that's the status with flex rotor. 
And uh, here are the sorts of things uh, the aircraft should be capable of doing. Uh, this is a demo I'm imagining, I'm imagining we might do. I imagine launching from a small boat uh, in Hawaii. This is not a very big boat, right? It's uh, 20, 30 feet. Flying for a couple of days to a small boat off the coast near Monterey, plucking down, doing a fully, doing a fully automatic turnaround, hands-free. Uh, turning around over the space of five days, coming back. That's uh, the sort of capability we think the aircraft will have. So that opens new possibilities. Uh, so uh, beyond weather reconnaissance, these are the kind of applications that we're imagining. Uh, magnetic survey, that's what that georanger on Prince Edward Island was for. Uh, remote areas, uh, you want to be portable. A small put footprint is often enabling. Uh, and here, it's, uh, you want to do things economically, right? Uh, how do you do that? We get the utilization high. Uh, spend a lot of time in the air, as little time as you can on the ground, uh, and have one person supervising multiple aircraft. We think that should be possible. Uh, operating off boats, this is what uh, uh, one of our aircraft was originally designed to do. That's why we developed that so-called skyhook with the rope and the man lift. Uh, we can operate off small boats. Uh, these are some potential applications, and those are the potential payloads. Uh, this is one that's often mentioned, monitoring wildfires. Uh, here, fire starts. You have to go where the fire is, right? Uh, again, uh, vertical takeoff and landing can be enabling in those circumstances, and then you want to watch for a long time. So long endurance is very helpful. Uh, so those are potential applications. So suppose that we succeed technically, and uh, we're in a position to do those. Let me now talk about the public policy uh, issues. What regulations must be satisfied? First, let's talk about ITAR. Show of hands, how many people are familiar with ITAR? Yeah, about half the people in the room. I gave a talk at Stanford uh, back in April, and I asked the same question. Every hand went up. If you'd done that, you know, when I was a grad student 30 years ago, you wouldn't have seen that. So I said, suddenly, uh, Stanford has become a campus full of arms dealers? Are there this many arms dealers at Berkeley? Right? Well, the answer is no. So why are people in this room familiar with international traffic and arms regulations. Something is wrong. You're not arms dealers. And what's wrong is bad policy. Uh, if you're in my business, robotic aircraft, you are deemed to be an arms dealer. The same way as if you're working on certain aspects of computing technology here at Citrus, you are deemed to be an arms dealer, right? And you start having to satisfy rules you never dreamed about. Uh, so uh, this is a problem. Uh, and in effect, it eliminates export markets because nobody can go through the paperwork and waste the time uh, that it takes to satisfy these rules. So in effect, it uh, denies you export markets. All right, so uh, if you're in my business, let's think about uh, domestic markets. Uh, there you have to deal with the FAA. What's current FAA policy? Well, it hasn't changed much since this was issued in September 2005. Uh, let's read the operative terms. Uh, C of A, that's a, a certificate of authorization. That's an instrument that will allow you to operate an unmanned aircraft. You need that. You can't just go flying. You need this special instrument or some equivalent. All right, uh, first line there, uh, civil COA applications will not be accepted full stop. End of sentence. Uh, that means if you're at Stanford uh, and you're a private university, you can't be public, and you want a C of A, you're out of luck. But this is okay, you're at Berkeley. You are inherently safer than Stanford somehow. You're a public <laughs> institution. So what can you do? Well, you could apply for one of these things. You have to give specific information. Look at these words. Applicants should anticipate a lengthy processing time. The government is telling you to anticipate a lengthy processing time. Imagine yourself in the position of a venture capitalist, right? The venture capitalist says, you have to wait for the government to give you uh, authorization, and they're telling you it's going to take a long time. What's he going to say? He's going to say, thanks for coming. Next. Right? He's not going to want to talk to you. Uh, so that's a problem. So access to export markets is blocked by ITAR. Access to US markets is blocked by the UFA. So uh, you're between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> so if you're a US-based, Entrepreneur, what are you left to do? Well, here's what happens. Uh, there's Deer Ranger again. It was actually started life uh, in a different 
uh, this was a variant, the original version is called C-Scan, which was meant to operate off tuna vessels and do imaging reconnaissance for tuna fishermen. And there's the aircraft on our test boat, which is a, sal a salmon saner. It's on a catapult up there. So this was a private thing. It's funded by public investor or private investors for private users, okay? What happened to C-Scan? It became Scan Eagle. Uh, it's now flown half a million flight hours over five years, primarily in Afghanistan and Iraq and off Navy ships. I mean, in that sense, it's been a military success, right? But that's not what we intended to do. But it's the only market that was left available. So uh, in this business, the military is really the only US market of any size. And it's really the only practical export market because only the military is, has, it doesn't matter how long it takes, right? Spending money is what they're for. It's not really about public security. It's certainly not about making money. So, um, so your, your domestic market and your export money are military markets, right? So here's ITAR. It's designed to curb arms trade. It forces you to become an arms dealer. Complete madness, right? And that's literally what it does. Uh, so what a wonderful policy. It uh, stimulates non-US industry to be uh, self-sufficient because they can't deal with Americans because as soon as they do, they're infected by the ITAR virus. Uh, it militarizes US industry guys like me and it undermines technical competitiveness. If you were uh, an enemy of the United States and you wanted to design a policy to undermine uh, academia and industry in this country, you couldn't do a lot worse than to come up with ITAR, right? So uh, fortunately, uh, there is some belated recognition that there's a problem here. And so a year ago, they said, we're going to do something about this. And I put in my input. I certainly hope that the Berkeley administration is putting in lots of input. And uh, this problem may get fixed. Uh, if it does, then uh, maybe the domestic, I'm, I'm certainly hoping that if it does, the export markets will open up. Then we'll be left with uh, the uh, FAA problem. Uh, and uh, to some extent, a problem elsewhere. Let's look at this uh, sentence. Uh, recognize need, or there's a recognized need for regulations for civil unmanned air vehicles. Non-existence of such regulations is a major obstacle for further development, right? So it works. Now we need regulations to set us free. A remarkable concept, right? Uh, so uh, in my experience, a lack of regulation has never really been a big handicap. Uh, but too much regulation can certainly be a barrier. And uh, that's what the FAA has uh, come up with. Oh, we'll talk about uh, appropriate policy and FAA policy in a second. Uh, let's talk about uh, unmanned aircraft or aircraft regulation in general. What's aircraft regulation about? It's all about safety, right? That's why it exists. Uh, safety for who? Well, safety for people aboard the aircraft, safety for people aboard other aircraft, and safety for people on the ground, right? That's everybody. Now, uh, mostly regulations are about safety of people aboard the aircraft. Because if you take care of them, you've taken care of the other two groups, right? That's, that's the way you write the regulations. It makes perfect sense. But uh, what, about, what if you don't have people aboard the aircraft? Well, then the focus is not on the aircraft anymore. It's on what it might hit. Uh, and you have to think a little differently then. Uh, what's important now is that uh, context matters, right? If you're going to protect people on an aircraft, it really doesn't matter whether it's over the Arctic or over a city. You do the same thing. Uh, but if you're worried about what it might hit, well, clearly over the Arctic, you have a much easier problem than over the city. So you have to recognize that somehow. Uh, so if you're over here, uh, you can have rickety, unworthy, unairworthy aircraft. If you're here, you have to be a lot more careful. So somehow your policy has to recognize this. Uh, all right, well, uh, here's where the discussion uh, is right now. Uh, first thing that comes up is this magic phrase, sense and avoid. You see lots of discussion like this is just one example. Uh, let's look at some of the key sentences in here. Uh, the biggest problem in allowing unmanned systems, in, or unmanned, uh, systems into manned airspace is the ability to avoid collision with airborne objects, especially manned aircraft. Maybe footballs, too. I guess that's what's meant to be covered there. Uh, all right, so uh, apparently that's the biggest problem, according to this guy at MITRE. 
Uh, and so if that's the biggest problem, then this fundamental question arises. Uh, whether unmet UAS, that's unmet error system, can perform sense and avoid function that meets or exceeds currently accepted C and avoid uh, capability of the human pilot. Turns out the answer is we can do that. Uh, and the way to determine that is first to ask what can the human pilot do? Uh, 30 years ago, uh, this question was on my mind. I happened to, I was a grad student at Stanford then. I happened to walk into the engineering library at Stanford, picked up a current issue of Journal of Aircraft, and there in one page was the answer to my question. Uh, what is the uh, capability of a human pilot? This paper uh, simply asks this question. How much better are we doing on mid-air collision rates than would Maxwell molecules? So we're just, suppose we were just bouncing around at random, okay? Uh, what would the collision rate be? Let's uh, look at the ratio between that and the actual rate, and that'll tell us how effective anti-collision is. Okay, that's all it was. So uh, we'll add up the number of flight hours over this set of years. Turns out we've since updated this calculation. It hasn't changed. Uh, and we looked at the number of collisions. We know what the cross-sections are. We know what the convergence speeds. So we do the calculation. All right, uh, so let's look at uh, air carriers. So those are aircraft operating under IFR, with air traffic control, right? Uh, over here, uh, that's the ratio of the random collision rate to the actual collision rate. So uh, whatever we're doing has, has three orders of magnitude better than random. So that's effective, right? That's good. Uh, but here, general aviation to general aviation, this is VFR, this is C and avoid. What's the ratio? It's one. Right? C and avoid doesn't do a thing. It's no better than random. Uh, that's not, if, are there pilots in the room? Yeah. Okay. It's no surprise to you, right? Yeah, every, every pilot knows this. Uh, so C and avoid is completely ineffective. So uh, what was the fundamental question? Uh, can unmanned aircraft do as well as manned aircraft? Answer, yes. <laughs> we can fly at random. Uh, so, uh, this is a word you hear a lot, equivalent level of safety. That's something that, that's talked about in FAA circles. Even the person who wrote that phrase, equivalent level of safety, has no idea what it means. Nobody has any idea what it means. But one interpretation is doing as well as a human pilot in this statistical sense, right? Well, okay, we, we can do that. Uh, so, that's my answer on midairs. But, uh, if you're thinking about mid-airs, and a lot of people are thinking about mid-airs and sensitive void and coming up with all kinds of wild technical schemes uh, to avoid mid-air collisions, to sense and avoid. It's not the problem. Uh, a much bigger problem is hitting stuff on the ground. Why? Here's the calculation. In the air, you have three dimensions in which to avoid things. That's why the collision rate is so low. It's not because we're seeing and avoiding. We demonstrated that doesn't work. It's because the sky is big. Uh, but on the ground, there are only two dimensions. That makes a huge difference. So that's where your problems are. Uh, so that's what we ought to think about. And we can do these kind of calculations. Uh, calculate the risk of harm by saying, well, the aircraft has a certain probability of failure. If it, fall, if it fails, it's going to fall onto the ground. And then we can do an integral over who's on the ground uh, and uh, estimate a probability of causing damage. And uh, here's uh, the way it's going to come out, right? There will be uh, some f on this axis, we'll draw bystanders uh, per square kilometer, right? Over here, it's a desert. Over there, it's a city. Uh, here, mean time between coming out of the sky, mean time between failure. Uh, and here are rates of damage that we might propose. So if we propose this one, for example, then if we're over a desert, we can have a very high, we can fail at every flight. It's not going to matter. We're not going to hurt anybody. Uh, if we want to fly over a city, we need a much higher mean time between failure, right? That's all this diagram says. Uh, well, uh, does the FAA get that? You can go to the FAA website and find out. The answer is no, they don't get that. Uh, turns out Transport Canada gets it, and the Australian CASA gets it. Some other people get it. Uh, let me explain to you a bit how the FAA works. Uh, the FAA makes, when they want to consider a problem like this, they make a committee. And uh, I have to take some of the blame, as I was on the committee. And uh, this committee uh, has people from all sorts of potential interest groups. 
And uh, you might, people remember the, the remark that's attributed to Bismarck, there are two things you really don't want to watch. You don't want to watch sausages being made. And you don't want to watch public policy being made. I've never seen sausages myself, but I was on this committee. And it, if sausages are anything like that, I don't want to see sausages being made. It's a mess. Uh, oh, this is supposed to be comprehensive, right? But really what comprehensive means to the FAA is we're going to be talking about only small unmanned aircraft and only within visual range, only within visual range of the operator, only in daylight. Uh, are any of you modelers? Any model aircraft people? Uh, well, if you know anything about model aircraft, I've just described model aviation, right? It's been going on for decades. So why are we making rules? Well, it turns out that uh, the rules say for recreational purposes, right? So it sounds easy. Get out the text editor, find the phrase for recreational purposes, and cut it out. It's an hour's work, right? You're done. Uh, that would be my idea of how you deal with this problem. That's not the FAA's idea. The FAA's idea is that you make this committee uh, with all these people. It was convened uh, three years ago. It reported two years ago. A notice of proposed rulemaking was supposed to come out this year. I don't know what's happened yet. Then there might be a special federal air regulation uh, a year after that. And then there might be an actual federal air regulation at some time in the future. That's the process. And that's only to deal with essentially model aircraft flying around. Uh, so that's the schedule. That's the process. And here's the thinking or lack of it. So there's uh, the picture we talked about before. Uh, first thing I'm going to do to illustrate what happened is uh, I've got to remove any suggestion that there's anything quantitative going on. Uh, any suggestion that there was quantitative thinking would be absolutely a, a misapprehension. So I've got to remove uh, scales. Uh, then uh, there's a lot of discussion about equipment mandates. Uh, so if you have a three-pound aircraft, uh, you can fly it up to 400 feet if you have a class two medical. And if you have a five-pound aircraft, you can fly it up to 600 feet, out to two miles if you have a class three medical on Tuesdays. <laughs> and there was discussion like that, these things being pulled out of the air. Uh, again, nothing quantitative, nothing analytical, but it was all groping at this idea of let's set up some mean time between failure somehow. Then there's a location mandate. Uh, you have to be, you can't be near a populated area. You have to be, you can't be near an airport. You can't be here and there. So that's all some, something like setting up bystanders per square kilometer. So in this uh, not very conscious way, it's defining a point in the space, right? Well, if you're defining a point, you've made a fundamental mistake, right? You need to be defining a line in the space. What are the consequences of, the designing, of defining a point instead of a line? Well, it means that no matter how uh, reliable you make your aircraft, flight over populated areas is forbidden. It doesn't matter how safe it is, that's just out. Uh, and if you make a rickety aircraft, or if you want to make a rickety aircraft to fly down here, that's forbidden too. You have to make an aircraft with this level of uh, reliability, not that level. And to go from there to there is expensive, and the economics no longer make sense. So those are the consequences of this policy. Well, a lot of discussion was had about that, uh, and reams of paper. Uh, at the end, a few of us managed to put one paragraph in at the end, which is this. Uh, if uh, you can show that uh, uh, risk is sufficiently small, then you can forget about all the other pages. That's the recommendation. Whether it'll be accepted or not remains to be seen. Uh, if it were accepted, then uh, there would have to be some uh, consensus standards about how you do these risk calculations. Uh, so with colleagues at the University of Washington, we put up a website, uh, which anybody can use, that uh, shows you how to make these calculations and let you plug in numbers and you can actually calculate risk for a candidate aircraft. So we're hoping people will use that. Uh, so recommendations that come out of that uh, for uh, regulatory authorities uh, embrace this risk-based paradigm. Uh, for people worried about ITAR, do something about the problem. I'm sure people here at Berkeley are well familiar with that. Uh, for actual users in the government, like NOAA, uh, which has been aware of the idea that you could use unmanned aircraft for weather reconnaissance for 20 years, uh, don't just wait around for the market to provide because there isn't enough of a market to provide. You have to be a market maker somehow. 
Uh, and then suppose you're an entrepreneur. Well, you might believe that any of that's actually going to happen. But if you're sensible, uh, you could do this. <laughs> Go where the rules are better. Uh, more reasonable licensing, more flexible regulators. Uh, but then you still have to ask the question, why haven't things taken off in these places either? And then that's the pesky economics issue again, which brings us back to why flex rotor. Uh, so I'll uh, give you some background here about some more flights. This is better video of what you're already seeing. And I'll answer questions about any of that for anybody who's interested. And I'll turn this down so you can hear over the din. So that's what this that guy is background. Feel free to ask questions. Or would you rather watch video? Hello. I, uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned it, but uh, what do you estimate this will be billed for? I saw that the Prado drone was upwards of $10,000 uh, per flight hour. Yeah. Um, what do you expect this to cost? Uh, I'm hoping that the aircraft itself will cost less than 100 k That's a hope rather than analysis. Uh, we'll be lucky to get the operating costs down to a few hundred dollars per flight hour. That would be a substantial improvement over where things are. It's, that's, that's the goal. If we do that, then weather reconnaissance and magnetic survey will become practical. So we have some other questions? Yeah. Is, is there any prospect to uh, lowering the cost by combining the technology you're using with, with some kind of lighter than air material to overcome gravity? That's not really where the costs are. The costs are derived from the fact that the markets are small and uh, kind of fragmented. You really need to have a market where you can make a lot of things. <laughs> That's what we're trying to achieve. Start front to wing going. As you gathered, we had a GoPro on for this last flight. This was two weeks ago. Well, is there a substantial market other than in weather uh, in terms of, for instance, uh, critical medical supplies in remote areas? Um, they'd have to be awfully critical. <laughs> Uh, the cost of these things is such that, uh, as a friend of mine used to say about satellites, the only thing you can think of that's valuable enough for them to carry be worthwhile is information. Carrying actual stuff is hard to see. What's the cost of a weather balloon flight? Uh, I, when I last checked, which was some years ago, it was normally uh, figured to be a couple of hundred dollars per flight hour, or sorry, per flight. So if we could operate over the ocean for a couple hundred dollars per flight hour, uh, that would be the equivalent of a few hundred dollars per sounding. And, you know, in places where you wouldn't get anything, that seems like a practical proposition. Um, in one of the early slides, I would just want to verify what I saw is correct. It said you can fly 4,000 kilometers for seven dollars. No, uh, for seven dollars worth of gas. I mean, right, that's what I meant. For seven dollars yeah. worth of gas. Right. The gas is not a very gallons. big part of our operating cost. Okay. No. So, but and it basically will hold two gallons. Is that? Uh, well, actually, um, Arison, it's one that's across the Atlantic, held two gallons. This one will be uh, about uh, seven kilos. Okay. So well, yeah, so yeah, it's about two gallons. Yeah. Of, uh, These are not very big airplanes. So, I mean, What's the speed of the uh, The economical cruise speed is about 50 knots. Okay, yeah, so it's, so it's a great rolling aircraft. Yeah, it's, uh, these, these small aircraft fly low and slow for a long time. Uh, so why does a Predator drone have to be so big and expensive? Uh, well, uh, I can give you the cynical answer. It's a military product, right? What's the objective of military products? Is it defense? No, that's secondary. 
Uh, it's to employ people. Um, so uh, that's, that's if, if you're interested in carrying a camera around, you don't need something as big as a predator. Of course, these days, predators are used to carry other than cameras. Uh, if you want to draw something that's going to go bang, you need something heavier. Thank you for a great talk. This is fantastic. Okay. Oh, I forgot my prop. Two senses of the word. If you want to see a rotor blade, give an idea of scale. Carbon? Carbon, yeah. So, by all means, go and have a look at the rotor blade. What? 2.0? Where? Where? No. It's a complex. Yeah. You'd be a big hit. I 